Hey, I'm Daniel, and on this episode of The Film Crazy Show, I was able to speak with the writer and director, Nicole Dorsey, for her film Black Conflux, which is a coming-of-age tale set in 1980s Newfoundland, starring Ella Ballantyne as high school teen Jackie, and Ryan McDonald as alienated loner Dennis, whose paths eventually intersect. The film is now playing in select theaters and on demand in Canada, and there will be links down below to watch. Keep an eye out later today for an interview I did with Ella, Ella Ballantyne, the star of the film, as well. But in the meantime, here's Nicole to introduce the show. Hi, I'm Nicole Dorsey, and I'm the director and writer of Black Complex, and you're watching the film Craziest Show. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, it's great to have you here. I'm excited to chat about your about uh, Black Complex. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me. Now, why is it called Black Complex? is my first question. Well, I wanted a name that sort of uh, was a signifier to the relationship between Jackie and Dennis, the entire film, and their lives run parallel, much like two rivers, uh, until they eventually meet. And that's the conflux of it. And I think the reason for Black was something to do with the dark waters, the sort of sinister feeling that runs throughout the film. Um, yeah, it, it, it seemed to be the words that work the best with the, with the storylines. Okay. I was showing early that I didn't know what complex meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, con- complex is just a synonym for confluence. Okay. So, so that's... It just confluence seemed a little too wordy, uh, black confluence. So, so uh, complex was just a bit snappier. Okay, I like it. Now, so that's with all the, that's why you really wanted to incorporate those visuals with the overhead of the, the river? Yeah, that, I mean, the rivers were written into the script from the get-go, from draft one. So that was always a visual motif in the film. And then the tricky part came with finding the locations that match that. Okay, now is that, is, did you always have Newfoundland in mind for the rivers? Yeah, I mean, the film always took place in Newfoundland. I came up with the idea while I was traveling traveling around. I was actually hitchhiking myself around the Irish Loop in Newfoundland and just became really interested in the idea of two people meeting from seemingly different worlds and whether that's fate or coincidence. Um, and then I went back in 2013 and shot a short film based on that idea and then wrote the feature and went back to shoot that. So it's always been a Newfoundland film. Okay. That's, I was curious about that just because I know you grew up in Ontario. Mm-hmm. So that, that was interesting. Yeah, I have family. My biological grandfather is from Newfoundland and my mom's half siblings are from there as well. And I don't know, I don't know if there was like a calling to the rock or what it was, but I wanted to go back. And then after visiting, I really wanted to shoot films there. Okay, I like that. Nice. Now, I also learned that you did a short film called Dennis in 2015. So I'd love how to hear how you incorporated. I'm just reading out my questions for this point because it's a <laughs> healthy one. But I'd love to hear how you incorporated Dennis into the world and why you felt like Jackie and Dennis worked so well together in the same universe. Well, I was always curious about a Dennis like person because that psychology is so distant from my own. And that's one thing that I really love about filmmaking is that it provides you sort of the 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 ability to step into somebody else's shoes for a moment and also explore personality that, you know, I I like to find empathy and understanding of others and see how people get to where they are and then perhaps add that to a, to a broader conversation for us to reflect upon. And Dennis felt, I mean, originally he was my own sort of investigation. And then as I was developing the story more and more, he became sort of a relevant subject, I think, in today's conversation. And with Jackie, I mean, in many ways, she's, I didn't grow up in the same broken home that she did. But other than that, I think that in many ways, she's a reflection of my own experiences um, and navigating the world coming up through adolescence. So they, I think, just were a happy marriage of characters based on those two things. 
uh, for me. And, and Jackie, of course, I think she speaks to maybe the female experience, but I think she just speaks to the adolescent experience um, a bit more universally as well. Now, what was it like? What was Jackie like when you first wrote her? And then what was she like when you got to filming after Ella put her fingerprints on her? Yeah. I mean, when I first, first wrote her, she was pretty hollow, I'd say, because I spent so much time on Dennis that I don't know if she was a fully fleshed out character because I think, you know, uh, it's a bit vulnerable when you're writing about yourself and putting yourself into something. But in the later drafts, I think I found her uh, in myself and in the story. And then, of course, like, you know, once you have your material and then you hire actors, there's a whole other layer that they put on it when they bring it to life. And I think in a lot of ways, Ella, sort of, we remind each other of one another. I think that there are some similar experiences and a kinship between us. So she really understood the character and what I wanted to do with the character and was just able to bring it to life uh, in a way I was so pleasantly and beautifully surprised by. Now you talked, you said that you had written like Dennis first and then uh, Jackie felt a little bit hollow. So I'm curious about your process of just like, did you write Dennis's story first and then you went to Jackie or did you kind of write like, like how did that work? Did you write, write them both separately? No, I wrote them both together. Um, I think it was more like fleshing Jackie's storyline out, but I had the major beats all there because okay. in writing a story where two characters don't interact for most of the film, uh, you have to do a lot of road mapping to ensure that it works. So it, it's a, even though they're different people, there is a lot of mirroring that takes place in their own journeys. Like I do regard this film as kind of this unconventional coming of age story because yes, Jackie is coming of age, but Dennis is coming into his own in his own way. So there were sort of checkpoints between the both of them as we go through the film in their arcs. So that by the time that we get to the end of the film, they're coming together sort of make sense within their journeys. So I very much had to had to do both at the same time. Now, what was it like getting into the psychology of Dennis? Because those scenes feel like very unnerving. Like, I don't know if they go towards horror, but like, it's almost like they're kind of like teasing that in a way. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the beauty of making your first feature is you can really I mean, the hope is that you just make what you want to make. And that's what I did. I think there are some horror elements or thriller elements within the story, but it doesn't necessarily go down the road of certain genre tropes. Um, and with Dennis, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I read uh, Elliot Layton's book, um, I read, which actually was about serial uh, crimes and uh, looked at sort of the character typing of people who commit those sorts of crimes. And that's a very dense book. He's one of the top academics in that. But I also morphed into to reading a lot about, you know, sort of media and how that shapes culture and a lot of sociological books and kind of dug into a lot of current conversations. I think that if this was modern day, Dennis would be probably an incel and find some sort of online community. And um, But in this film, it's the 80s. So instead, he feels isolated. So yeah, I think he started very much as a product of research. And over time, you know, I also wanted to humanize him in a way as well. And um, have I have a lot of, I was searching for empathy for him. And I'm always careful when I use the word empathy because I don't mean I feel, I don't feel bad for him. Uh, it's more so empathy is about an understanding of him. I'd also love to ask, just you said this in 1987. So what, why the choice there? Was it just uh, an era that you, era that you like? Yeah, I think there were a few factors. Um, it is an era that I like, but I also, 
I don't know. I feel like the eighties were a very heightened time in terms of sort of media influence on gender roles and sort of the setting men up to feel like they are empowered in a very specific way that women are for their pleasure, viewing pleasure or whatever it is, because just from magazines and movies, the role of women was so specific. And I think that for a character like Dennis, when since the time you've you know, been a little boy coming up and you anticipate the world to present itself towards you a certain way and it doesn't, there's a lot of sort of not just outward loathing, but inward loathing um, that takes place um, and feeling inadequate. I think feeling inadequate is a big thing with Dennis. Um, so it just, I don't know, this era, and it was the height of slasher films, um, which painted women a very certain way as well. Um, and it just seemed to make sense for the film. And I knew I also didn't want to, if it was a modern day story, you would have to incorporate technology and social media and all of that. You couldn't tell the same story presently. And I didn't want to go down that route. I kind of wanted to just get to the sort of inner, inner psych of all this stuff without, <laughs> with all the tech, without all the technology. Um, so that's yeah, kind of why I went with it. In '87, I was I was born in '87, so it felt like a good year. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's that's with all that said, that's interesting. Just like that, it isn't bogged down by the social media, and it's pre like all the shootings and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of those aspects. So I think that's interesting. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I think all, films that are modern and incorporate all that stuff. Obviously, they're necessary and great, and that's what we're dealing with now. It's just it didn't make sense for this story that I wanted to tell. Okay. Now, I'd love to ask about the the music in the film. I'm just going to look at my questions for the note uh, for the song. So, at the beginning, with the "Hey, Who Really Cares?" is that really Ella singing? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it's her singing live. Actually, we recorded her in the uh, in the auditorium we were filming and she's got a beautiful voice. Um, we when I was originally casting, we had actors sing in their auditions and Ella was going to she's in um, like an art. She was in an art high school and kind of specializing in more like music theater sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, she's got a beautiful voice. Yeah, for sure. Now, did, did you need a singer for the role or was that just a happy accident? Um, I mean, it was always written in the script okay. and I knew I wanted the film to open with her singing. And uh, originally it was a, a Joni Mitchell song for that opening, but then the Linda Perhack song that we that we found was uh beautiful and just also made sense for what she was going through lyrically and setting the story up. So I, yeah, I absolutely wanted that. I didn't know whether we could pull it off live or we'd have to record and, and sort of dub it in, but uh, yeah, Ella, Ella brought it. For sure. Now, can you talk about like the staging of the song? Cause like the, the tempo is a bit more slow. It's a bit more haunting. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, kind of knowing that there was this sort of opening long piece with the rivers and the title sequence and setting up the tone of the film as well um, made sense. And because it goes right into this audition sequence that she's uh, doing in the film and the opening, it also made sense for it to be a cappella without music. So uh, I think that also lends itself to this haunting feeling and being recorded in this sort of massive gymnasium, there's a natural echo to it um, that, again, just kind of helps set up that opening. Obviously, I, I think too, there's, you know, I'm a big Rosemary's Baby fan and there's for sure mirrorings to that. I mean, I love 70s American cinema, uh, which I'm sure if you watch the film, you can see clues of that throughout. But uh, yeah, I'd say the opening has a bit of Rosemary's Baby to it for sure. Okay, cool. 
Now for the Joni Mitchell song, did that fall through just because of like, I guess, getting it for the film or did you just, did, did the other song just feel <gasps> right? I'm trying to remember. I think I remember Joni being very hard to get in touch with because she okay. lives like up in, I think, Dapanga or something in California. Um, but no, I think uh, I love the haunt. It, it was actually a song that's unreleased by Joni Mitchell. It was a, a like a B-side recording um, called Day After Day. Okay. And it's really beautiful. There's like one sort of scratchy old recording of it. And I think I loved it. Well, one, I love Joni Mitchell. Two, there was a, a bit of a haunting quality to the song, which I think worked well. But then the Linda Parahack song actually just lyrically worked so much better. And I knew we could sing it, you know, as we wanted, um, kind of put our own spin on it. So I think it works better for this piece. Okay. And it's interesting because it's a song maybe not a lot of people might have heard. So it's like, it's like your, it's almost like your version, like Ella, you're hearing Ella sing it for the first time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how uh, popular Linda Perhacks uh, was in Canada. I, and, but also, you know, she was a seventies folk singer. So um, yeah, I don't know if people often hear her work. Yeah. Fair enough. Now, Going to Ryan, Ryan McDonald, I saw that he was nominated for uh, Best Actor at the Canadian Screen Awards. So what does that mean for your team and that you helped direct him to that nomination? Oh, I mean, it's so he's so deserving of it. Ryan is an incredible actor and so easy to work with um, and just really puts himself fully into the role. Uh, ever since I saw his audition tape, I just knew he was the dentist. He understood the complexities of the character. And also as you watch Dennis throughout the film, there are times where you, you know, you look at him like a little boy. Sometimes you look at him like a complete jerk. You know, it, 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 he has this, Ryan brought this range to Dennis, um, which was something I was so looking for in an actor. Uh, and definitely found it. So I think we were just all thrilled for him to have that recognition because it's a difficult character to play. For sure. Now, like finding him, did you did you audition a bunch of different people for Dennis or was he one of the first choices? Um, his tape came in early. His agent was um, very uh, proactive uh, in a way that normally I'm like, I don't know, agents are always pushing their clients. So sometimes when you get an email, you're like, oh, okay, sure, sure. But he wasn't wrong. Uh, once we saw Ryan's tape, you know, it was just instantly, he was at the forefront. And yeah, we saw actors from all over, from Ireland, England, Australia, LA, New York, all over Canada. Tapes came in. We had I went through so, like hundreds and I didn't even see them all because the casting director, you know, narrowed them down. So, but at the end of the day, Ryan's just very clearly stood out. What about Ella? Was she one of the first choices? Yeah, her as well. Um, it's funny. I, I saw them both early and we still went through the process, but I just always went back to both of them. Ella had come off a uh, Canadian Screen Award for her role in Anna Green Gables, the, the movies, um, okay. those series. And, but she was still quite young looking when she was doing those. And I don't know, we, we joke about that she had a summer of coming into her womanhood of growing up. <laughs> and um, yeah, she taped and really wanted the role. And I also knew like the moment I saw her, I was like, oh, that's our Jackie. Okay, cool. Now, I also thought it was interesting that you guys shot this in July 2018, I think. Um, we shot uh, August. No, we shot September. September okay. 2018. Yeah. Okay. Now, what, what's it like filming that like three years ago and now it's finally coming out? Is it a bit surreal? Yeah, it's totally surreal. I mean, there's, it's, I've, I've shot something else from then uh, till now and um, yeah, we had our premiere in 2019 at TIFF, right. so that, that's, it's been a bit of time, but 
I'm super excited to have it live out in the world again. Um, we had all this excitement with releasing it and then th the world went quiet for <laughs> whatever year and a bit. So to be back out in the world does feel good. Um, yeah, and I, I guess sort of there's this, I don't know if I'm quite in nostalgic territory if it's been long enough for that, but there is a bit of distance from the film. So that's interesting when talking about it now. Yeah, that was definitely one of my questions if there was like, because obviously this is your first film, so it's kind of like your baby, but it's like there a bit of detachment to it almost. Yeah, in a way. I mean, you're always growing and you want to try new things and, you know, yeah, you're, you're always going to look at your film and see little bits here and there that you want to change or wish you had a change or whatever it is. Um, but I, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm excited for the film. Um, it definitely, I think with your first feature, there's a bit of a license to just try things out as well. Sure. And, and I really did get to do that with Black Complex. You're, you're kind of in my head. Cause that's, that was my next question just to see like in the, cause obviously you've grown as a, th a filmmaker since then. So is there anything that you would have directed differently or any different choices you would have made? Um, you know, there are the things that I would change. It's like, you can't really change because it's just a, a, a part of shooting, you know, where you're like, Oh, I wish I had more time to have shot this sequence or Sure. Uh, yeah, but that's just the nature of shooting. <laughs> it's going to come up no matter what your budget is or whatever it is. But um, no, I don't know why I'm kind of like happy with maybe the little quirks or imperfections of the film. I'm, I don't know, it's, there's a, a bit of a charm in the quirks for me. Yeah, and I, I think that's neat because you could just look at it and be like, oh, okay, that's 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 something that I remember and I can do better or I can improve on next time, I guess. Yeah, I just, I you know, I think of other great filmmakers that I love and thinking about their first features because I thought about that a lot before I shot of their, they have a little bit of messiness to them and that's what makes them so special as their first feature. You can see some playfulness in there. You can see some freedom in there. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to have that in my first film. Yeah. Obviously, Jackie's a big part of you. So in the you've, you've grown since you made the film and all that. So is there any advice you would give to Jackie, uh, who's still finding her place in the world? Yeah, I mean, I think I kind of the end of the film in her her kind of speech at the end is basically the advice that I would give her, okay. which is that there's no there's no finding yourself. The myth of like finding out who you are and who you'll be for the rest of your life uh, is not a real thing that you're just you're constantly evolving and making new discoveries about yourself and doesn't matter your age or how old you get that's a, sort of a lifelong journey so um i think embracing that versus i don't know this unfulfilling <laughs> desire to 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 sort of pin who you are um yeah i think that's the i think that's the advice which is why she says what she says at the end. Yeah. Okay. I think I think that's why coming of age films are like very interesting. That like they're always like younger on the younger side. But like even even me, I'm at, I'm 26 right now, and I'm still like finding what I want to do and everything. You know. So I think that it never ends. It never ends. I it was 17. I remember I told my mom when I was 17, I know who I am now. Uh, and she laughed at me and I was so angry because I was like, no, I know, I know who I am. I know what I stand for. I know my beliefs. And, uh, but she was right to laugh because that's a silly thing to, uh, to declare because <laughs> it's not, it's not true. And, you know, as I go through my thirties, I think, I, I think you just become more 
comfortable sitting in the unknown and that it's more of a journey. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you were right, mom. <laughs> yeah, definitely. She was right. <laughs> now, Nicole Dorsey, writer and director of Black Complex, thank you very much for chatting about your film on the Film Crazy Chef with me. Ah, oh, thank you so much for having me.